Hi, hi, Mum. Hi, Curly. So you're going to tell us. So Noam and Batsheva have asked you to tell your story. So let's let's start with the beginning. A very good place to start. Yes. So, I was born in Brussels, in Belgium. I often call myself a Brussels sprout because I sprouted in Brussels. I was born in Brussels eight months before the war broke out. My parents were Polish Jews from Warsaw who had come to Belgium in 1929, my father in 29, my mother in 1930. They were a young, young married couple, 22 and 21. They'd left their families. As a matter of fact, they never saw their families again. They came to live in Brussels, in Belgium, for a variety of reasons. Number one, my father was a very active, proactive person who wanted economically a better life. He also was looking for a place where the anti-Semitism would not be so fierce. And um, very enterprisingly, he moved on his own to Brussels, which was then quite a big leather centre. And my father was a glove maker. Um, so he came to Brussels. He managed to get a job almost immediately. Was not highly paid, but he got a job. And my mother, he brought my mother out a year later. And their family backgrounds or their political affiliations and Jewish affiliations, as well as where they were coming from. They were both from... Both from Warsaw. Both from... Um, they met in a Bundist youth movement where they were really, it was a dream to live a better life. Both families were very religious, very fromm. They moved and they joined the forces that the new winds were blowing and they, they joined this new um, secular wave of Judaism. My parents never forgot that they were never, it was never a lesser priority to be Jewish. It was very important to them to be Jewish, but they saw a Judaism that wasn't going to be a Judaism lived in the synagogue and so on. They saw a lot of repression by rabbis keeping the people down. They wanted more freedom and they were enamored of Yiddish and Yiddish culture and they made that their Jewish platform. So they came to uh, Belgium. My father immediately involved himself with a very small Bundes group that uh, existed in Brussels. And he got a job and he brought my mother out. And I was born, my, my sister was born first. She was born in 1934. And then I was born in 1939. So I was just a few months old when the war broke out. And at first, we kept on living normally in our own apartments, although I'm sure my parents knew that the threat was on and that there was going to be a very changed situation. In October 1940, the German authorities, the Germans who had taken, the Germans came in, I should say, they came in in May 1940 into Brussels and I was just what 16 months old and they brought with them of course um, the whole hateful ideology they came in the Wehrmacht came in German army accompanied by the Geheimstaatspolizei better known as the Gestapo and um, in 19, October 1940, they had a system, very organised. In October 1940, they demanded that all Jewish people over the age of 15 
register with the with the um, the local institutions, and um, that they have the letter J stamped into their passports, into their travel documents. Well, my father and mother were not Belgian citizens. They, they lived 20 years in Belgium and would never became, were never granted Belgian citizenship. They wanted, but they, did, they were not granted Belgian citizenship. So at this stage, they were still Polish citizens as they were till the time they left. And my father decided together with the Bundist party, the Bundist party, the family, they decided they were not registering. They were not the only ones. I read later on that 13,000 Jews did not register, so something like that. So we continued to live in our apartment and I was just growing and I was a little toddler and I did all the, all the things that little toddlers do. I have memories of some of those things and um, like walking in my mother's high heel shoes and falling on the on the radiator and opening up my head. I've got the scar to prove it. Um, and that kind of thing, you know. So I was just a little toddler. Then in, I think it was May 42, they brought in a new, a new edict that all Jews had to wear a yellow badge. Now, I don't recall ever wearing one, and I don't think my parents ever did. But certainly things were becoming very serious. July 42, there were lots of rafle, roundups, and it was becoming a very serious situation. And my parents started really looking for a way of um, ensuring that their two little girls would be looked after and would be placed somewhere. And I believe we were placed at a camp first, but that's not important. I don't have no memory of it. Well, I do a vague memory. My sister has more memories of that. But I do know that in January 43, I had just turned four. I was taken by my mother to a place in the very fashionable part of Brussels, into a lovely three-storied house, very lovely house, a house my parents did not know, my mother did not know the family, through connections of, um, in, in, my father had an accountant before the war, and through him, she found this family where the daughter was in the resistance and um, they, she obviously said she, she would take a Jewish child. She took my sister first. My sister was there for six weeks, um, but then she was taken out and I was brought in. What I didn't say also was that the, um, the old Jewish bank accounts were frozen. Um, my father's little business, he had already built up quite a little, it was already 10 years that he'd been in Belgium. He had built up and made a very nice little business, uh, which he'd worked hard at. That was all taken away and um, a lot of Jews were left destitute, they were left without money. I believe my parents had a little bit of money that saw them through the war. But I went into this place in January 43. I remember the day very well. I remember what I was wearing. I was wearing a little, it was winter of course, Europe in January. I was wearing a little knitted two-piece suit with a little cap and had little red blocks on the top. I asked my mother later on, did I ever have a thing like that? She said, yes, you did. And um, I went, my mother took me by the hand, took me to this house in Ucla, 
not far from a lovely park, Bois de la Cambre, it's very central in um, Brussels, near the Bascule, which was a sort of a shopping area. And the door opened and a lady, she was in, I, I discovered later, she was in her 60s, um, greeted us at the door with a lovely, gentle smile on her face. Um, very neatly coiffed, her hair up combs and very, she very neatly dressed, a white apron. She was the matriarch of the family. It, the house belonged to her and her husband. And she opened the door to greet us. I remember the, the flooring in the entrance hall, black and white tiles. And I remember going in there um, and my mother, we didn't get very much further into the house. My mother left me there. And I remember my mother saying to me, they were the last words she said, that I should be a good little girl. I should behave myself and not give trouble to these people. Well, I was only four. Uh, those people turned out to be a beautiful, beautiful family. This lady that had opened the door, uh, we knew her as Nana. She was the grandmother of the household. Her husband was a professor of law and music, Charles van den Boren. He was well known in Europe for musical um, involvement and um, uh, he was secretary, I think, at the conservatorium and so on. And he was so well known that the um, Nazi regime actually asked him to give a series of lectures. And uh, he, at the time, um, refused on the grounds that he was too old. He lived to be 90 or more, but it was his protest. He was, did not want to collaborate and cooperate and work with that regime, which was totally abhorrent to him. So he and his wife owned the house. Living with them was their one daughter. They only had one daughter, Marianne. She was married to an American uh, musicologist who had come to Belgium to study under this professor of music and um, had fallen in love with the daughter and married her. When I went in there, there were three children. The youngest one was about um, nine, eight, nine months younger than me. The other two were close in age, uh, Anne and Philippe. Anne was the eldest and um, and Philippe, boy, and uh, so they were a pair and they spent a lot of time together and so on. And then there was this little Marie known as Miquette, um, who was, as I said, a few months younger than me. And she and I became a little pair. And uh, she remembered, she told me years later how delighted she was that she had a little playmate um, because her older brother and sister, of course, thought her very little and young. And we became um, very close and we spent all our time together. Uh, we, were, we went into the bath together. There were no, no bars the way we know them today, not even in such a lovely house. But we had a, a tub and we used to sit in the tub together and we used to warm our feet under the stove together and we used to play games in the garden together and we were dressed in exactly the same way. There was one enormous difference between us. All those children were fair and blue-eyed. And I was dark with brown eyes. And anyone, of course, who knows the ideology, the Nazi ideology about the, the type of person that Jews were looked down upon because they were short and dark and the really the people of the future were the tall blonde that that type of person 
So it was very noticeable. And, um, and in fact, I had a, an incident I remember very clearly. Uh, whilst hiding there, uh, one night I was in bed and I was awakened uh, by someone coming into the bedroom. It was Nana, accompanied by um, a German, and I, I woke up to see the, the boots next to me and the helmet. I looked up, there was this helmet, and I knew, I didn't understand, of course, what all this was about, but I did know that they meant danger for me. I knew that my mother had left me there because it was dangerous for her to keep me at home and that we were in a dangerous situation. So there was fear, the fear that a little four-year-old experiences, doesn't understand logically, there's no, that can't reason it out, but I knew. And I remember to the present day, I remember him turning to Nana and saying in a very heavily accented French, and with a bit of a smile, oh, she's darker than the others. And I don't know what Nana answered at that point, but I heard later on from Philippe, so many years later, that Nana set it up. She was dark. She was dark. She was the only dark one in the family. So supposedly I was a little relative from the country who had come to Brussels and um, and when there were these searches through the house and they kept on going because the American son-in-law had to had to escape from that house they came to get him uh, being an American after Pearl Harbor and he he was an American the authorities came to look for him. They were at war with America and they were going to get every and each person that had anything to do with this, every American, as every Jew. And he escaped. He escaped and so that they used to come regularly to search the house looking for him. And apparently when they did come and do this search, Nana would pick me up and hold me in her arms in order to underscore the dark similarity between her and me, which would give more thrust to her story that I was a little, a little relative from the country.